May is Stroke Awareness Month in the UK, and many of you will be aware that there are more than 100,000 strokes in the UK each year, causing 38,000 deaths, making it one of the leading causes of death and disability. Less well known is the plight of young carers. These are children and teenagers who look after their parents after a stroke or another medical accident. Figures from 2015 showed that there were 243,000 carers under the age of 19 just in England and Wales alone, and 22,000 of them were below the age of nine years old. So that's almost a quarter of a million stories out there that are largely unknown. At the age of 17, Nicholas Connor made a film about one of those stories. Cottonwood is a film about a single mother who suffers a devastating stroke, leaving her teenage daughter and seven-year-old son, played by Max Vento, to care for her, testing the family's strength to hold things together as the roles are reversed. My name's Oshin Lunny, and this evening I'm delighted to be joined by Nicholas and two of the stars of the film, Leanne Best, who plays the mother, and Katie Quinn, who plays the daughter. Thank you all so much for joining me. Um, so Nicholas, I, well, I just thought I'd ask a question to all of you. How's everyone getting along with COVID-19 and the, the lockdown and all that kind of thing? Uh, we're, we're having good good fun inside, right? Yeah, no, I'm getting on. <laughs> That's what we're doing. <laughs> That's yeah, it. No, I'm getting on, kids. I'm getting, getting used to the world through lots of little squares. <laughs> oh, oh, you're not wrong. Yeah, when, when, you, when you go to sleep, you see Zoom, Zoom calls in front of your eyes. Uh, so, Nicholas, I'd like to come to you first, because you made this film when you were 17, which is, I mean, I'm trying to think of what I did when I was 17. It certainly wasn't making a film. It's a tremendous <laughs> achievement, and it's it's a really powerful statement uh, of a film. I was, uh, for want of a better phrase, I was in bits after I watched it. I was incredibly moved by it. I thought it was such a powerful statement and such a timely statement as well. And these really are young people uh, who don't get the spotlight shown in them. Um, very often. So, what, what you know? What's your background, and how did you come to make this film? And was there anything from your own personal life that inspired you to make a film about this subject about young carers? Um, so, my grandmother suffered a stroke uh, when my mum was uh, very, very young, about ten, and she actually sadly passed away a few days later after the stroke. Um, but I was always left with this feeling of what would have happened if she'd survived, um, what would have happened, would she have been left to care for her? Um, and it's always kind of laid in my mind throughout my entire life, what would it be like to be in those shoes, to have to look after someone? Um, and it was only when I looked at the statistics for child carers and strokes that I kind of thought, this is something I'm not aware of and I don't think a lot of people are. Um, so the approach to that was just, this story needs to be told. Um, I think that this is the right time to tell it. Um, and if I don't, then I don't know who else will. So it, I think that was the, the kind of core drive for it. Fantastic. And I believe um, you, you actually have an interesting family background, if I, <laughs> if I can stay with you for a second. This is pretty cool. So there's a big, you're at the black sheep of the family because all of, most of your family do something totally different, right? Yeah, I, I live, uh, well, uh, I'm from a family of golfers, so my dad's a golf pro, my sister's a golf pro, my brother's a golf pro, my mum was a golf club manager, so it's all <laughs> a massive uh, professional golf family, um, so it was left with me, oh, I want to go and make uh, movies, mum, uh, or, or magic, and she said, right, okay, well, maybe stick with the movies, I don't know, <laughs> so I, um, I still kind of wish it's back with the music now, to be honest, but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> with the magic. <laughs> it's it's all good, but that but that's a a great vignette of your of your life. It's, it's it could be something from a film. That moment when you have to tell your folks that you've decided not to be a pro golfer is is a interesting conversation to have. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, so um, Leanne, talk to us a bit about what drew you to the film and how did Nicholas get in touch and uh, you know uh, talk to us a bit about your involvement and how it happened. So my agent rang me and said that she'd received this script and she'd had a look and she thought it was great and she told me the premise of the film and I'm like yeah well yeah definitely like I'll have a read and she went now just so you know he's 17 and I was like what she was like he's 17 the kid who's written it who's going to direct it 17 so I read it and loved it 
and was a bit like yourself. I was in in bits and also mm. incredibly impressed. And um, I didn't read it with a caveat with Nick Sage. I just read it as, is this a woman that I can play? Do I think it's, mm. I can get emotionally invested in this? Is it something that I'd like to be involved in telling the story of? And then um, I got in touch with Nick and we, uh, we had a coffee, we had a lot of coffee in London. And I uh, always say this within five minutes of meeting him. Because it's a, you know it's a very uh, it's a very exposing thing to do to to go into a project like that dealing mm. with that level of subject matter it's got to be really deftly done it's got to be somebody that understands nuance and pathos and how to tell a story without using too much you know it's got to be so I wanted to meet him first and within five minutes I was convinced and I thought he's and I'm not just saying it because he's here I thought. Every now and again, you come across someone who's a little bit special, and I thought, oh well, okay, yeah, I'll do it. But we made a deal over the, over coffee. I'd sort of already. I probably should have told my agent before, but I was like, yeah, I'm definitely gonna do it. Um, <laughs> nice. But we made a deal. I made a deal with him. I said, listen, if I do it, I'm not gonna. Um, I'm gonna be the way that I would with any director. So, yeah. seventeen goes out the window. Like, if we're gonna make this film together, we're gonna make the film together, and we had a really, uh, a really robust, brilliant kind of five days like hammering it out in this in this uh in the process of making the film yeah yeah fantastic uh, and nicholas for you so uh, it was this your your first film uh project so um i made i've made a few shorts before cotton wool i'd made uh think of me which kate is in uh northern lights oh, yeah. Yeah. um and they slowly kind of progressed in kind of working up from kind of more student-y kind of things and then Northern Lights was the first real challenge, really, where there was kind of some stakes involved in making sure that this project was like up to the, the standard of the budget. Um, and that was about an hour long. So we jumped into that after a couple of shorts. Um, but I'd been working in film for a few years before that in terms of like, I used to work in production and kind of uh, continuity and script supervising and stuff. So um, it's sort of been a, a journey Ever since I've been about 13, I've been on film sets um, professionally. So it's kind of just been a, a lovely journey so far. Wow, fantastic. And you can see the, the background of your, you know, you can tell a lot by somebody's, uh, you know, personality from their background on a Zoom call. And yours is film posters, DVDs, your shelves creaking with DVDs. So obviously it's your, your real passion. Um, mm. How much of a learning experience was it, you know, working with Leanne and working with Katie on this film is very powerful subject matter. And how much of the journey, you know, it, how much of a journey did you all go on together uh, as you kind of learned how to make this powerful film? For me, it was a massive learning experience because it was kind of thrown in at the deep end. I mean, the, you're not, there's no guidelines of how you work with an actor there's no rule book or you, you know I know there's film schools for directing but they don't tell you how to work with an actor it's sure. instinct and there's things that you don't say and there's things that you should say but you know and you definitely learn from those things I mean there's a few times where I've probably said awful things that it would make an actor feel insecure and it's just learning from your mistakes really um so, you know, working with Leanne and working with Katie and you realise that all these actors are so, so different in their process and have to adapt constantly and create that safe space for everyone to be as creative and collaborative as possible um, with what's there on the page. Um, and mostly we stuck to the page, but it was um, when we needed to, we certainly ventured away from it when we needed to. Um, but yeah, I mean, I pass it on to Katie and uh, Leanne, really. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, Katie, I was wondering if you could talk a bit, because what age were you when you uh, shot the film, when you when you acted in the film, Katie? 19. 19, wow, wow. And w what kind of reaction? Because I, I thought you played that amazingly. You kind of have this, this journey of transformation and, um, you know, c coming to terms with what happens to, to you in the film, your character in the film. Um, you know, and it's very much from the viewpoint of, of someone your age. How, what was the reaction of your friends, like the, the people who were the same age as you? And, and you know, did the film give them an understanding of the issue of young carers as well? I'm, I'm curious how it acted out, uh, how it was received within your age group. Um, yeah, so when my friends watched it, they were, they were a bit like, I can't believe 
you're here but you're on the TV and I was like yeah, yeah. Um, but they were very much I think that was great because they kind of took me away from that and just focused on the story so they yeah. felt the real emotions for the characters um, and they were all crying um, <laughs> yeah so many people did um, but yeah I think that really hit them because they were a bit like oh my god I've never seen a story like this before and my friend is telling it yeah. but she's not my friend she's someone else on the TV <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think it really did hit them. I, I wanted people to cry. <laughs> I wanted yeah. people to feel that real emotion for the characters. That was my aim. Um, so yeah, I think in my age group, it definitely woke people up to the idea because they had no idea about it. And I didn't have any idea about it when Nick first told me. Mm. Um, so yeah, learning about child carers was like a new experience for everyone, but I think it was something that they needed to know. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, th this, the, the film, which is out now on Prime Video, is, uh, you know, I think it continues this great tradition of British filmmaking from folks like Ken Loach and Mike Lee, of films with a powerful social message. And the, the one thing that, you know, after I'd, you know, dried my eyes and, put, you know, got myself together after watching the film, I was in bits, uh, you know, the, the thing that I kept hearing in my head was, there's no such thing as society. And mm. this is, of course, the infamous quote from Margaret Thatcher many moons ago. And, yeah. you know, the, the, your film is sort of a depiction of this philosophy just carried through and carried through and carried through. And this is, you know, just one story of over a quarter of a million. Mm. Um, so, but the, I, I mentioned Ken Loach because I believe there's a link, uh, yeah. Nicholas, between yourself and one of the folks in the Kez film, is that right? And you consulted with somebody from, from Kez for, for this film, yeah? <laughs> it was weird because uh, it, I contacted David Bradley, um, who is the young boy who played um, Billy Casper. Amazing. Um, just what was it that, that got you to this place of such a powerful performance at such a young age? Yeah. Purely because with working with young Max, he was only about six during the shooting of the film. And it's a very vulnerable place to put a young person in, um, in the place of a child carer seeing quite traumatic events. Mm. Um, you need to put that safety net around them. So I thought I need to do my research in this. I need to speak to people who've been there. Um, so I contacted him and we had some great email conversations about um, kind of advice on how to work with them. So it was, um, yeah, it was very important. And those films, yeah, definitely, as you say about the, the Thatcher kind of, society it was so inbuilt into the film i mean the whole compassionate argument um and how society is becoming slightly more disconnected as we're becoming you know i mean it's it, it, it is becoming even worse now i think yeah. um and it's obviously driven by governmental measures technology and what have you mm -hmm. um and that, yeah, I, mean, I think I was studying it just beforehand. I think when we were discussing it, I was going through my own emails and I, thought, I typed in Thatcher in my emails to myself. And there was Thatcher quotes and notes everywhere studying her during cotton wool shooting. Yeah. So very built into that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's something, it's, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if those lines were actually mentioned in the film, I can't recall, but it's the one thing that just was like, yeah, this is it. This is, this is where that road leads. Um, and the character of, of Max is really interesting. Uh, staying with yourself, Nicholas, because it's a real picture of, you know, this innocence, but also the isolation of childhood and the isolation of a child carer. Um, uh, when we were talking uh, previous to this call, uh, you pointed out that there was this, you know, really heartbreaking story of a, uh, a young girl called Chloe from old uh, Cottesy who is basically been providing emotional support for her family, her brother and her mother. And uh, she's, she's been doing this since six years old. And I think this is something that happened even this week. So she hosted a 26 hour Lego challenge to raise money for charity at, at the age of 10. Now, you know, can you kind of imagine the, ay, just the strength of character needed to do this? And, you know, again, this is one of a quarter of a million uh, stories. Um, you know, what, like, from your point of view uh, as a director, you know, was did Max kind of represent one facet of, of childhood and, you know, uh, Katie represents another facet of, of the teenage years and, uh, you know, what, what kind of intergenerational story were you trying to tell through the different characters? I guess it was the innocence 
of childhood being forced into this position of adversity mm. how how can you survive in that i mean how would you face it i mean maybe i mean maybe one criticism could be that his character is too perfect or that he dealt with it too perfectly but a lot of children would have dealt with this scenario in a very perfect and empathetic manner yeah. um but the, the the difference with katie's character jennifer was that she'd developed this relationship of teenage years kind of the um i, I don't know how to put it almost you know the typical teenager phase and once you've developed that there's this even worse sense of parent versus you know child yeah as soon as those two things are rubbing against each other it's hard to take that away i think i'm sure katie would be able to speak to this too it's something we probably all do um yeah and i think that that was important to say not everyone would be this perfect, pitch perfect way of looking after a parent that would be that struggle um, to look after them. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, and coming to you, Katie, uh, I mean, did, did you have to do uh, a lot of research for the role in terms of finding that character? I mean, it, you you kind of did the, the thing where you're just on the phone, on the sofa, you know, very well. And, uh, you know, do, do you find that that's a, a, a common thing? for your generation where people are very much involved in the social media and Instagram or, you know, whatever it is, um, uh, you know, how much of that character resonated with you as a, as a person and how did that all weave together? Well, I think, um, you try and say to yourself, Oh, when I was a teenager, I wasn't like that, but, um, I probably definitely was at some point. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think my generation's kind of okay with the social media, but I look at like my my friends, younger sisters and younger brothers now, and I think, oh my God, get off your phone and stuff like that. So I kind of just took it from that. And then the research I did, like I looked at a lot of um, videos online of like child carers and Nick sent me a few and things like that. And it was very difficult because I felt like for me, I would not be this character. Like I would not be this in denial about it and be so moody and horrible. and. So that was quite difficult, but um, yeah, I think trying to look at teenagers nowadays and the stereotype of teenagers nowadays were always being on their phones um, mm -hmm. was how I kind of brought that into the character. But I feel like my character, she, yes, she was, you know, not everyone's cup of tea and she dealt with it the wrong way, but I don't think that was because of like, I don't know, I just don't think it was arrogance or anything like that towards them. I think it was denial. I think she didn't yeah. want to be her mum like this, nobody would want to, um, in pain and like not being able to walk properly. Like you, you want, and because it kind of spanned from an argument that the mother was having with her, I felt she kind of blamed herself. So as long as she was in denial about it and pretended it wasn't happening, then she didn't have to come to the fact that she probably was the reason it was. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wow. that's, that's very, very honest, you know, it really was a, a very honest scene. I mean, speaking of which Leanne, uh, you know, how do you prepare for a scene like that? Where did that come from where you have the, I mean, there's, there's a many scenes in the film, but the one where you have the stroke is, you know, is, is breathtaking. T tell us a bit about how you approach that scene and, and what it was like and, you know, where did you kind of draw from to, to play that? Yeah, like Katie was saying, Nick gave us really specific points of references and things that he wanted to incorporate, like specifically into his script. Yeah. Um, I spent a lot of time like researching online. We have a great resource there. So um, I did a lot of like what actually happens to the brain when somebody suffers a stroke like that, what happens to the body. I think yeah. that um, if I was really specific, I mean... I can't lie, I read the opening scene and saw what would be required and was like, wow, that's incredibly important to get right. It's really yeah. exposing as an actor. There's no sci-fi, there's no CGI, there's no like... Um, so I just decided that the more I knew about what would actually happen to the body and what actually happens to the brain in that circumstance would be the way that I would approach it. And then... Um, I can remember reading a, a interview saying that often there's the um, the moment where the person is completely disorientated because they don't understand what's happened. 
Mm, and yeah. I just, when I read it, I just thought like the catastrophic level of fear mm, that that yeah. individual must go through. What yeah. you're literally upright putting the laundry away. And then the yeah. next minute you're on the ground and you don't know what's happened. You try to move your arm, your body isn't responding. Mm. You know, so, um, yeah, I sort of, I went from there with it and had a little there. Uh, but I, I mean, I have to say, I'm not just saying it because she's here and Max as well. Like Katie and Max were just so unbelievably brilliant to work with. So it meant that like Max in that scene, Nick did a very clever thing. He just sort of told him what he needed him to do. And we had a little chat and then he kept him away from me just for the, just for, so he didn't know, we didn't really block it. With oh, yeah. 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 Nick basically said, these are the beats that I need. This is the length of time I think it might take. Um, mm. So we're just going to go it and just don't stop till I shall cut. And then, um, so I did the thing and then Max came in. So what the reaction you see from him is probably quite a lot of, you know, as much as we created a really safe, I mean, it was lovely, you know, it's an independent yeah. film and actually the happy accident of that is that we were all literally like, ah, yeah. And then in the house together, like a family for five yeah. days. So weirdly enough, all of the work that you might spend weeks and weeks in rehearsal trying to do, we didn't really do. We just got on with the business of like, being in a family unit, all of us, the cast, the crew, you know, producers, everybody, it was all hands on deck to get it made. So I think he felt in the middle of a really big bunch of people who were all like, he was just one of the gang and blah, blah, blah. So I think that moment where you see him register the shock of what's happening and yeah, and his response to what he's seeing is, is really realistic, which was a little, which was a great touch from Nick really. Yeah. But I was, um, there was, yeah, I just wanted to get it right, you yeah. know? Yeah, you definitely do. I think it was if, like um scheduling thing as well, making sure we shot Max first, you know, making sure that we, you were very, very kind in saying, make sure that you put this first, don't worry about me, I, I'm fine, let's get this right. And we were very conscious of that. And I think one of the, the, the most shocking scenes film was the um, mini stroke which is the kind of yeah. stroby ayahuasca -y, MDMA yeah. kind of hallucinogenic scene where Max just threw himself into it even yeah. more than anything I'd ever seen before and it really really blew me away um, yeah. and that was partly mostly down to his building that relationship with Leanne and Katie I think um, is mm. so was so essential to him feeling that because he did didn't he at one point Leanne when you were shooting your scene he just threw himself on the floor and started kind of completely going off script and we were like we did tell you to do this <laughs> wow it was incredible yeah yeah i mean leanne spoke about this feeling of having the, the the family feeling on set and you were there for five days and you know really went for you know very very close um nicholas to, you know do you think the, the concept of family and support and society has changed uh you know since, since you were younger perhaps um you know are, are there any parallels between you know the, the role of faith perhaps when you were younger and the role of faith today and you know we, we we live in an era of these weapons of mass distraction you know the mobile phones and everything we kind of have different mm -hmm. frames of reference H how do you feel it's changed and what is your film saying about that 100 percent. i think the whole faith aspect of the film it's so important because I mean it's fundamental really mm. you know I don't want to say too much about the end of the film what happens but if you see it there's a, a quite an important point in there um but I think to me as someone who grew up I grew up Catholic um I, I'm no longer religious in any way but I think that that communal communal love that was held in kind of these in less secular times i think as we mm. move to a more secular world and a secular culture um i think we're losing something of the communal love and we're replacing it with social media so our deities aren't you know uh, non-existent beings anymore they're becoming more the phone that you know and that's it, it means there's not a sense of the other i mean as we're becoming more woke 
and everything's becoming self-aware, self-indulgent, uh, kind of self-referential. Um, it's everything's about the self rather than the other person. And I think that as we step away from that, we need to find a way of bringing community back to compassion. And I think that's yeah. really core of what the film's about, how society's moving away from that. Um, and we're becoming more disconnected while becoming more interconnected. So yeah, I think that's a very core part of it um, and how I've seen the change. I yeah. also found though, like what I thought was so erudite about what Nick had written as well. And I should say there's a, again, not to give too much away, but there's a key character in the script who's a, a lady that sort of knew me very casually in the community and is keeping a little eye out. She keeps seeing Jennifer Katie's character getting into scrapes here and there. And then she clocks the little boy walk into the corner store. He hasn't quite got the money to pay for a pint of milk. And, mm. and what I loved about that is, I think absolutely, we all know that we've got these issues on, on a much grander scale about what society is, what community is now, and how we're all mm. trying to navigate that. But one of the things I found incredibly hopeful and courageous about the film is that like we're seeing now we are in an unprecedented catastrophe in our community families yeah. and what I'm so moved by and what I was really moved by in Nick's film is the second you present someone with an opportunity to help they most likely will mm. yeah. and that if people are just paying a bit more attention it's not willful disregard, it's almost accidental disregard for each other. But if you allow people the space mm -hmm. to notice what's happening next door, to notice what's happening to that kid, I think the overwhelming sensibility is to be humane and to try and help. And I think there's a thread of that through Nick's film that left me feeling incredibly hopeful whilst raising the incredibly challenging question of but why isn't there anybody else there why is there institutional yeah. help mm. because Absolutely. You people without institutional help in a community that's fragmented you leave them incredibly incredibly vulnerable so I think that's the two things are playing out in Nick's script at the same time so. mm. 100 percent yeah and I look I, I, I I remember the character you're referring to. She's a lovely character. It, again, yeah, that kind of filled my heart. Yeah, it was yeah. beautiful, beautiful. And you make the point there, um, you know, we're living through unprecedented times, uh, Leanne, as you, as you rightly say. We're in the middle of a global pandemic. And the UK, as of a couple of days ago, I believe, has reached the highest death toll in Europe, despite, you know, a few factors which one might presume would be be to its advantage, like being an island, uh, you know, having a, a month head start, etc. That does seem to be, you know, lowering levels of confidence in the government to, to help people. I know stuff is being done, but, you know, do you think incidents like the COVID-19 pandemic and how it's playing out in the UK might help people look, you know, with, with greater awareness at things like you know issues like child carers and as you say there is no other help for these children they're not getting help from any kind of administration um you know is COVID-19 an opportunity to to look at society with through a new lens if you like um I have a desperate hope so yeah, yeah. and I think yeah. that there's I saw a brilliant thing the other day saying we're not all in the same boat we're all in the same storm mm. Yeah. And I thought it was utterly spectacular and describing, you know, listen, I won't go into what I think about what's happened because we've got time. <laughs> but what I will say is um, if you've created a society where in the face of something so shocking as the pandemic we're all living through mm -hmm. and your biggest concern is how people will eat and keep their electricity on and how literally the most vulnerable of us might be offered up as some sort of herd immunity sacrifice, then I argue there is something wrong with your society. I argue that we are all in a very leaky boat because 
if you have more than enough and the person next to you has nothing, then nobody's got enough of the yeah. things that I believe are a real currency, which is compassion. And it might seem very flowery and it might seem very, you know, woo-woo. And But I, I think what this is displayed really starkly is that we don't have a middle ground mm. for protection. Yeah. yeah. And who are we if we leave a six-year-old boy in the middle of a global pandemic to go to the shop to buy bread that he can't find for his mom who can't walk? I mean, yeah. if you look at this story in the context of what's happening now, who are we as mm. a society? Yeah. And I love that millions are being raised for the NHS, but the NHS is not a charity. Mm. Yes, 100%. So, that's what I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> well said, well said. Thank you, Leanne. So, you know, you said there, we're not just in the same boat, we're in the same storm. And the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic casts a new light on society. Um, Nicholas, to what extent, you know, the, the film is on the surface, it's about child carers, but to what extent is it about more than that, about society as a whole? I think it's probably, it, 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 child carers is at the forefront because it's the yeah. political, it's the more, um, it, it's the forefront of why I'd made it. But I think the underlying core message is more about society and about, you know, compassion and about how we're sociologically changing our communities around kind of, I don't know, I just, I have a very traditional mindset yet very liberalist. Um, and I think while we're losing some archaic, horrible, you know, things, we're also losing some really core parts of our livelihoods in losing some compassion and replacing that with something new. You have to be careful to keep that. But that's not to say that compassion doesn't exist. This period of time proves, if anything, that compa compassion can exist more than we ever probably expected. So, I mean, it, it's a great time to see this coming together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, t <laughs> I to totally agree. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, Katie, coming, coming back to yourself, um, talk to us a bit about, you know, that scene where you had the heart to heart. The, the, and it was really the emotional epiphany of the film was when you have the heart to heart with your mother, played by Leanne. And, you know, it has an incredible emotional resonance. Um, you know, how, what was it like playing that scene? And, you know, what did you have to draw upon? And how how did that come together? Because it was such a powerful scene. Um, yeah, that was um, that was probably the most difficult scene for me. Um, I remember I like throughout the week, me and Leanne had a few little scenes together, but that was the first big scene we had together. And I thought, right, okay, I'm really gonna have to pull this out the bag. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't like it helped the kind of atmosphere we were in. Like it was dark, everyone was quiet. It was very much like. Although everybody was there, I, I was by myself. Um, and I, for me, it's just, if I think about something for long enough, then I think, right, this is actually happening to me. Um, so that was, yeah, it was very, it was very, I don't know, it was just like overwhelming. And I feel like it, it was such a thing of emotions where like I had to, you know, make up with my mum, but also the, the, doing that scene, which was one of the most powerful scenes, it was so overwhelming for me as well that those emotions just kind of came out and I just kind of felt it like um, authentically. So yeah, that was, and then just looking at Leanne was great. <laughs> she was looking at me like, you do this, you go. Um, so yeah, that was great. And then, I don't know, I ju it just kind of was like a relief to do it. And then once we'd done it once, Nick went, cut, nobody speaks to Katie. And I was just laying there like, <sighs> Oh my gosh, wow. that was so powerful. And he was like, nobody talked to Katie. And then we did it again, like a few times again. And each time I had the same feeling to it. And I think that really helped Nick um, that you told nobody, like tell everyone not to speak to me because then I could just remain in the moment. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was one of the most powerful scenes I've done. So, it, I mean, it was it felt great afterwards. Afterwards, I was like, oh, felt like I was just in a completely different world. 
And I remember yeah. um, Jess on set was wanted to come and speak to me and she was a bit afraid to speak to me. <laughs> she was like, are you okay? I was like, oh, I'm fine. Yeah, it's fine. She was, like, I just didn't, she was like, I didn't want to like come over if you were just very emotional. I was like, no, it's cool. Um, so yeah, it was very strange to be in an atmosphere where everything's so emotional and so overwhelming and then, you know, walk out the room and it's daylight and everyone's smiling. Um, mm. But yeah, it was a great experience and it's probably the most difficult scene I've done thus far. So, well, that yeah. was one of the things, wasn't it, with working on Northern Lights particularly, um, was finding that ground when we were first working together, how, how, how you work with an actor really varies project to project, but establishing what need, they need is quite important. I think that it, it, it is setting that tone. I think even just one of the things Alan McLaughlin, who was the DOP, did, he, he said, I just I don't want to have any lights on in the room when we're shooting mm -hmm. this. I, I don't think they should be able to see the crew. It's, it, it just completely means that they were absorbed in it. Um, so I'm very thankful to my crew for just, uh, honestly, I don't, uh, we wouldn't have done it anywhere near as, you know, somewhat well than <laughs> we would have done without the great crew. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the film has been recognised, you know, a lot in the uh, you know on the professional circuit and and by you know film critics and film reviewers and by the film world um you've had 72 nominations i hope these figures are up to date 45 wins and 27 festival selections so the the reaction from the film community has been incredibly powerful um was that something you were expecting i mean it's it's a bit of a leading question but like has has the reaction surprised you <laughs> Me, for me, yeah, yeah. <laughs> massively. Um, yeah. I mean, I always knew from the last day of the shoot, from the first day of the shoot, the, the, the one thing that whether the film was had the worst script or it was badly directed or uh, terrible, any part of the production, that the one thing that would stay true is that the performances were great. And I can't take credit for that. It's, you create the space for it, but the actors really... I knew from core that there would be something there, at least with the performances. So it's nice that Leanne and uh, Chrissy and Katie and Max have all been able to pick up some really lovely awards. Um, that hasn't shocked me. Uh, <laughs> Very good. I have. <laughs> I'm even like I'm Katie's mum, actual mum. <laughs> I'm so proud. <laughs> That's gorgeous. I love it. Uh, and, and outside of the world of film, like I'm so happy it's been recognised as it as a, the powerful work of art. It is, uh, you know, with a real social purpose. It's come at exactly the right time. It could not have come at a better time. Uh, I'm so happy it's on Prime Video. Um, but Leanne, I'm, I'm curious because you you're like busy with many different projects, and you know, has cotton wool inspired a, a particular kind of reaction from your friends what, what's the reaction in your circle been like um well it is really interesting to echo what nick said and i will also say i'm going to blow katie's trumpet again just very slightly that first, i think we had a, nick put a few in the can for standby but that scene the scene that you're referring to she came in and did that on the first take i think it was the first take mm -hmm. wow. Um, wow absolutely extraordinary young yeah. woman and yeah. she'll be seeing a lot of her i will say that um, a beautiful, beautiful actress, a gorgeous girl, love her dearly, amazingness. Right, that's that. So I knew that it was something a bit special and you work on a lot of things. Now, listen, I can't lie and say that on the first day of filming when I'm about to play a woman who's had this like catastrophic stroke, I was like, oh God, I hope this goes well. Dib, dib, let's hope. <laughs> um, didn't have a huge amount of time for any of it. Turned up at a B and B and had a kip and then got up in the morning and like I said hello to Katie for ten minutes and that was that. So like we got involved. And um, by the time we'd finished, I haven't worked on quite a lot of things. I knew there was something special in the can, and then um, I am. Um, I was really floored by everybody's way and all of it, like the entire cast and crew and creatives. Um, but the it's been really overwhelming actually. The uh, the response to it already uh, people I know that have seen it and you know the usual thing is oh my god I can't believe they're all so young I can't believe that this piece of work has come from this really young group of people I'm like he's not no he was 17 that she was 19 you know yeah. Max was six <laughs> like 
Oh, and the, 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 you know, and the other cast and every, you know, amazing cast. But um, do you know what I think has been the thing that shocked other people, which is what shocked me? And I didn't know, and I like to think of myself as a very socially conscious person. I make it my business to know what's going on mm. in the world I inhabit. But I didn't know it was anywhere near that number of kids. And I think, you know, we like to bandy, I say this a lot, we like to bandy around politics, but politics is always personal. Yeah. It's always personal. And to cut through a lot of those headlines about, you know, the welfare state and do we have enough resources and how do we possibly help people when there isn't any money in the bank and blah, blah, you know. And then you look at a story like that, you allow people a window into somebody's life that they might not, you know, you can con people sometimes they don't want to watch it on a documentary. It makes them a little bit resistant. You know, they'd rather watch Tiger King sometimes because it's a bit <laughs> easier. But, you know, we've all been there. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but actually, you know, in the context of a film, you allow people, it's almost like you allow them play politely into the story mm -hmm. and then you suck them where they're here. So they, like Katie said, they can empathise with what it must actually be like to have to try and live like that, practically yeah. live like that. Yeah. Um, so that's been the big response for me people just going oh my god it was bad enough watching it I was so not bad you know I was so moved by it and then you see the statistics at the end and you go surely not yeah surely not in England that doesn't happen so that's yeah. what I'm most sort of proud of and that's what's been the main response Amazing. Just to add to what Leanne said there, like I remember at the premiere and any time there's been a group of people watching Cottonwall, the statistics come on and you can actually hear everybody in the room go, oh my God. It's like, it's like I've just watched a story, but it's not a story because it's actually happening to other mm. people. So when those statistics come up at the end, there's just like an air in the room and everybody goes, oh, what I've just watched like wasn't fictional. Like, yes, it was fictional, but it's completely what loads of kids are going through every day. So yeah. that's a... There was a woman at the screen, and wasn't there? There was a, a woman at the screen, and who at the end, there were quite a lot of people there, and, you know, we all went and had a little drink afterwards, and she was there with her son, wasn't she? But it was older by then. And she came over, and we were chatting away, and um, she was in a wheelchair, and she said at the end of it, she was like, well, thank you very much, because that was our life, wasn't it? And, wow. the, um, mm -hmm. and I swear I could cry now thinking about it and I thought well if that's if that ain't it is that not why we do it then mm -hmm. I don't know what is sometimes you know so yeah very powerful thing. yeah absolutely and um, a, a recent study I believe found that 80% of young carers feel isolated and alone because as, as we saw in the film you know they can't hang out with their friends they can't you know do the stuff that other kids at school are doing so much um you know katie in the film had the uh, the, the pager and that kind of thing um it, this is only going to be exacerbated by covid19 and everyone going into lockdown so much of the other parts of people's lives are just not available anymore um nicholas what do, you know are, are you kind of seeing since making the film, and I know you did a lot of uh, research with uh, various charities preparing for the film, um, what perspective do you now have on the issue of young carers in society under the context of the COVID-19 pandemic? It's just been made obviously incredibly worse and I don't think that they're getting anywhere near the amount of support that they should be getting. Um, I mean, I remember, I think a lot about when we did the research, and we were set up with interviews when during the writing process. Um, the Stroke Association put us in touch with a lot of people who'd suffered strokes. And we yeah. didn't mention at this point that we, we'd want to speak to child carers. And I tell you now, every single story we went to was if a woman or a man whose child was looking after them. And I think about that now and I think, what what would that world be like now for them? Because... If everyone else is finding it difficult, imagine how 10 times, 100,000 times worse it is for them. So, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. just, it's just exacerbated. It's um, very difficult time, very, very difficult time, especially for people in uh, facing adversity. 
Yeah, and a, a lot of the, the, the folks who maybe ha- are being looked after by young carers, they might have compromised immune systems. You know, they, they can't really afford to have any potential overlap with the virus. And I'm just thinking of the sense of responsibility on those kids' shoulders anyway, and how much extra stress they're going to suffer as a result of having no support during the pandemic and no support in, in kind of, you know, regular life. Um, there was a study in uh, three years ago um, that showed childhood stress can actually knock 20 years off your life. So if you have a, that kind of stressful childhood, it's, you know, it, it, it can be, you know, brutally, uh, it can cut your life short, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Again, I'm, I'm so glad this film is, is, that you've all made it. And I'm so glad it's, it's being released and it's going out there. I think it's, it's very important for people to see this. Um, but Nicholas, I'd like to come back to you on a, a slightly more practical aspect of it because you, you were as we've heard you were you were like very young i mean you've, you've been making films for years but you yeah. really were young going out and making this incredible statement uh getting this all together how were you you know was your young age in any way a, was it an advantage or was it a barrier in some scenarios um you know did, did people take you seriously and the film seriously i think Bar maybe one, one or two people I've ever experienced has had a pro. I mean, there's I've I've struggled with a lot of ageism generally in the industry, but yeah, um, there's so many isms and there's so many uh, people struggling that it, it's probably not worth even spending time on. But I mean, the one thing I know is that the people who truly needed to believe in me in this film did and they put their faith in me and trust in me to kind of take a risk. And it I was a risk. I mean, it, looking back now, <laughs> the massive risk. Um, I mean, there's, the reason why actors are probably paid so much sometimes is because it's their careers that go down the pipeline. If they get in a, a terrible performance in a film, the director's not very good. Um, so it's a massive leap of faith taken in... Um, in potentially ruining your career. <laughs> so um, luckily it didn't do that. <laughs> but um, no, it's it's been very nice. I mean, I, only now kind of three years later is the film, uh, have I started getting calls from like the BBC or whatever, or getting interviews with those kind of people for TV. It's taken till now to get to that point. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I'm glad that that you had the the right support and the you know people were, were open to the the power of the work. Um, this this is a question which any of you might like to hop in and comment on. Uh, I mean, we've seen a series of scandals. It, you know, it's 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 not unusual to have these scandals coming out. It's a it's a you know we had the Windrush scandal and we had you know various things. Um, a quarter of a million teenagers and children with no support looking after their disabled, ill parents. Is this a scandal waiting to happen? Uh, what might it take for this to become a scandal and for people to get angry enough uh, to kind of force some social movement around it? Um, well, I think one of the great things this film does is it makes people aware of it because if nobody's aware of something, then they're not going to do anything about it. Um, And I feel like it tells it in an extremely real, yet extremely painful to watch way sometimes. Um, And I think that's the only way, because people like to, you know, outside, out of mind, like sweep it under the carpet. If I don't know it's happening, then it's not. So, but I feel like, especially in like days like this, like everybody knows COVID-19 is happening. It's affecting everyone. So now everybody's suddenly aware of it and wants to do something where we'll try and help in any way. Whereas you need to, people need to be aware of it. There needs to be either more, um, more people with platforms talking about it and films like this and documentaries and like shown on mainstream TV, because if people don't know about it, then people don't know about it and they're not going to do anything about it. So. Yeah. Absolutely. I totally agree. Uh, Nicholas, were you, when you were researching it, were you, uh, shocked that you know that it was such a, a big issue and that nobody had really shone this this brighter light on it before. Nobody had made this kind of a film before. Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. I think I don't know if uh, what am I going to say. I think for me, the fact that I didn't know about it was the very reason to write it. And I think yeah. that 
kind of this sounds really pretentious but the reason why writers and creatives do what they do is because they are saying that they were wrong about something at one point they had this belief and this is where they've got to now so they've realized something it's that whole character arc and i think for me it was that realization of god you don't know how grateful you should be for how you live and how your life is when there's people like this suffering every day without you know basic necessities even now especially um and with real struggle real human human struggle um so yeah i think that for me was the the real charging point if i didn't know and i felt like i was socially conscious but you know not compared to a lot of people but then this needed to be told definitely yeah absolutely and would you have any recommendations if people are they they watch the film they 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 see it on prime video and they feel inspired to do something to help have you any words of advice or maybe places you can recommend that they find out more information or just well, uh, yeah definitely i mean if if you're struggling with kind of particular issues especially if you've suffered a stroke obviously get in touch with the stroke association um if you're a young carer get in touch with um young minds and if you're interested in these topics maybe donate to these um the great charities because they are the people that are not politically it, it yes. shouldn't be political to have basic necessities of helping someone with mental health issues or young carers it should be given that support um so giving to those charities that especially now are being starved of all funding i think it's very important um so yeah. if that's interesting definitely those kind of places yeah yeah well, well said well said and actually at the end of this uh, interview we're going to show the uh, phone numbers i believe or for the or the website addresses for the stroke association and young minds and those are both amazing organizations i beg you to find out more about what they're doing and do support them if you can um so i'm, I'm just curious it, like the, the film has been out for uh, some years it's it's had all those nominations 45 wins 27 festivals uh, it's now going on prime video so after you watch this webinar please go on prime video and check out the film it is really really worth your time it really is it's very powerful i was in bits i think it's very important to see this film uh, for for many different reasons um what's coming up next for all of you uh you know what are you working on more films are you are you going to be working with this film for a while or, or just what are you up to in general um i'm going to direct that at katie first me first okay um well at the minute I'm trying to finish university <laughs> wow um, i'm in the last month of my four-year degree um international business and spanish <laughs> so oh, i've got fantastic. that and then I'm going to go out and I'm going to, well, hopefully when all of this is back to normal, um, I'm going to hopefully get an agent, get, try and work. Um, I think Choel Productions has got like another film in the pipeline. So hopefully we can start to push that in the future when everything's back to normal. Um, yeah. But yeah, for me, it's just now that I've finished uni and I've got a degree and I've got a backup, um, now it's time to just completely focus on that and do what I want to do, which I have wanted to do since I was like 10. So yeah, yeah, that's it. That's gonna be for me getting headshots, getting everything sorted, getting an agent, hopefully, if one will take me. And then <laughs> um yeah, just working. That's what I want to do. Fantastic. That that's a wonderful plan. I, I look forward to to following it and uh, and reading about you in the future as well. Uh, Leanne, same question for yourself. What's happening in the world of Leanne coming up? Working heavily on Zoom at the minute. <laughs> yeah. Basically <laughs> mum. That's taking a huge <laughs> amount of my time. Um, so, yeah, it's a six-part drama. <laughs> um, sorry, sorry, my mum phoning. No, I've got um, the isolation stories that are out on ITV at the minute. I shot one of those bananas, brilliant uh, kind of response to everything that's going on with ITV. Yeah. So I shot one of them, Eddie Marsan and David Trelfor. So that's out on Thursday night on ITV, I think. Hey. And then I have a... Uh, a drama with ITV uh, coming out, I think, soon-ish, and also uh, Young Wallander, which is like the Wallander series that reboot is um, due to air on some other place that I don't know if I'm allowed to say in this. Um, but yeah, that'll be out. Uh, yeah, I've got I've got Young Wallander coming out in the summer. If you wanted to watch that, I'm in that. 
Yeah. Fantastic. I, I I'm looking I'm... at Katie again and our Nick. <laughs> uh, Let's do it. Get, get, get... Let's do it if we can get Max Vento. He's fucked up till 20. <laughs> Not that I feel weird about that because he's a lad. <laughs> fine. <laughs> but yeah, that's it. I am I am very much looking forward to that six part of uh, you know drama about conversations with your mum. Uh, no, that's just no, just going to be amazing. No idea. <laughs> 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 excellent, excellent. Uh, and how about yourself, Nicholas? Are, are you still? Uh, do, do you still have to do some promotion around the around cotton wool, or are you working on future productions? Or, or how are, how are things with you know COVID nineteen and the lockdown and filmmaking in general? Well, I'm, I've been working in animation for a while, weirdly oh, enough. Yes. Just, yes. Um, so that's okay because it's all external teams and I can kind of give directors notes um, through online sources. So it's been okay. But um, yeah, I've got some really interesting projects and doing a, a biopic, uh, The Great Man Called Paul Skates, which I'm really interested in exploring um, and talking about what I can. And then I've got a film called The Betrayal of Maria Savan uh, coming up which is in development, which, which I'm very excited about because I, I want to change people's views on love, which will be uh, get people to break up with their husbands and wives and uh, <laughs> girlfriends. And, friends. and this is all over. There's going to be a queue outside. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be COVID babies and COVID divorces. COVID babies and COVID divorces. Oh, yeah. It's, I'll make uh... it myself when this is all over. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, the world will be, will be <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, that's the plan. Um, wow. Talk about try and change. Me. If if there's ever been a break break up film, I hope this has been a, a good one. <laughs> Whoa, excellent! I'll, I'll be looking out for that for sure. <laughs> I'll be looking out for the aftermath of that. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd, uh, I'd, I heard on a podcast. What was it? The uh, the Recode with Cara Swisher and Scott Galloway. They had. Uh, uh, a guest on who spoke about COVID being not only is it a an opportunity for a reset in terms of societal values and how we look at society and you know do we have a society at all? Um, he said it is the opportunity for a reset. It's it's once in a lifetime. It's once in a generation. This is the opportunity to look at how we value things like a healthcare system and how we value things like you know looking after our elderly and you know. Uh, the value of everyone's lives, uh, you know, exactly as you said, Leanne, we're not in the same boat, we're in the same storm. And this is our opportunity to recognize this. And um, I think personally, I think Cotton Wool has a huge role to play in this transformation of consciousness and the fact that people should be knowing about these issues. It's a fantastic work. And uh, thank you all so much for making it. And uh, thank you all for your time this evening. It's been a real pleasure to speak to you all. Um, so for anybody watching at home, I just again want to please ask you to go to Prime Video and watch Cotton Wool. It's an incredibly powerful film and it has been made for, you know, by these lovely people from the heart for all the right reasons about a really important issue. And, uh, you know, I hope you'll enjoy it. I hope you'll get involved. And we're going to actually show some details for the Stroke Association and Young Minds now. And please do support the film the Stroke Association and Young Minds, if you can. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Nicholas Connor, Leanne Best and Katie Quinn. My name's Oshin Lunny. It's been lovely to speak to you all. Thank you.